Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for sticking around. The reason why we added the session um, this year round is that we, we found out that there is a way of grantsmanship and knowledge about how to write a winning grant that some people had and other people didn't have. But SVRI really wants to encourage everyone to um, try, if you have an innovative, good winning idea, to go for this grant and, you know, and don't get stuck um, by, you know, not having that knowledge. And we know that we have a lot of people who applied for the grant the first time, like Enrica said. And so this is a bit of a way of telling you a little bit about how a good grant looks like. It is targeted a lot around the SVRI grant, and it also follows the template it had last year. But obviously, the whole knowledge can also be used for other kinds of grant applications to other funders. I just wanted to start with some hard facts, and that is that grants do get rejected. And regardless of whether it was a small grant or a big grant, it's always really painful because every time you put a lot of work into it, because every grant you submit needs to be as good and as perfect as possible for you. And it has happened to me um, a lot of times out of every grant I received, I did not receive two other grants. And, um, and it can be quite devastating um, sometimes because a lot of things obviously depends on the grant and sometimes you just really believe in the idea. So, um, but this is just to know you're not alone and don't give up. Um, and the other thing is that Angelica mentioned really nicely, the only real deadlines are grant deadlines. This is what Laurie Heisey once said to me. And basically, as she said, if you submit later, it won't count. So really make sure you submit on time and actually, as I would say later, submit slightly earlier because things always go wrong. And that's the most awful thing that can happen to you that you messed up the time differences and the time zones. But one of the things is, and also um, Angelica talked a little bit about um, what are the criteria, what are the themes, what are the eligibility criteria. You really have to find out whether this SVRI grant is the right grant for your idea, for your organization, for your research. And the way of doing that and learning that is actually really going through, um, you know, obviously the eligibility criteria, um, going through um, all the information that is there. But what I always found was really helpful and I actually do every time I apply is to try and find out who got this grant beforehand. And SVRI is extremely open about this. It's on the website. I put it on the right-hand side up in, in the slides. To, like, for example, they say where they funded grants, who they gave the money to, who is the PI, and who are the partnering organizations, and what the work is about. And it gives you a very good flavor of what they were looking for in each year, because you will also see there is a real time trend in terms of the topic they found. And then potentially, you know, one of the people who received the grant, and I don't want to say to all the 80 people now, please reach out to everyone who got a grant before, um, because people might not be too happy. But in some ways, it's really useful to talk to people who had a grant before to have a look at applications that other people have, have done to get a sense of how does a successful grant look like? What did they write? How did they make the connections? And um, how did they build up several storylines? And then, as I said already, pay really close attention to the call. Angelica had said in the first round, they actually check for eligibility. So if you don't meet this very hard eligibility criteria, um, you might be out very immediately and not, you, your wonderful idea wouldn't have even been looked at. Um, and it's things like check whether your institution already had an SVRI grant. If, if you're in a, in a bigger university, for example, this might have happened without you, you knowing. Um, and just make sure that you really meet all these, these criteria. And then really look at, is this grant the right thing? Does my topic really fit into that? And I thought the question was really good about the sexual reproductive health issues, because obviously there was some, um, it wasn't clear enough that this would be very welcome. Um, but maybe if you work on gang violence, then potentially this is not the right grant for you unless you have a very clear gender component. So it's really assessing it according to that, because this is what reviewers will, will look for. And, I'm reviewing a good of 100 
grant proposals a year from very different organizations, the EU and, and research councils. And very often you have fantastic ideas, but they just don't fit the call and they weren't written for the call and according to the categories they ask for. And that's a real, real shame very often. So how do you go about writing a grant application? This all seems very obvious, but um, it often isn't. And it's the one most important thing is that writing a grant really takes a lot of time because it's not just a simple process of writing a proposal that takes time. It's also because you need to proofread it. You really should show it to other people. Um, show it to people who know the field very well because this is a very subject specific um, grant so it should be shown to other people who know violence against women or violence against children because these are also, also the people who are on these different stages of the review and definitely on the last expert panel as well and um, then it's really helpful to get the terminology right um, and to be very clear and, and have everything written out, out clearly and that often takes time but also you have to proof um, read it very well, because finally, as a reviewer, you immediately see all these spelling mistakes that when you're writing it yourself, after a while, you don't see it anymore. And things I therefore do is that I often do, I mean, as nearly everyone now, I write them on my computer uh, on a Word document, and then I, I do different stages. I read it out aloud to me. Then Word now has this nice new function that Word reads it out to you. And when you hear it, you pick up a lot more mistakes and, and grammar issues and missing words. And then I print it out on paper. I actually read it on paper when you see a lot more mistakes. And then I read it out loud on the paper. So it's quite a process, but that's how you pick up a lot of the small, small mistakes. And then, as I said already before, technology features. I know someone who missed the grant deadline because she mixed up the European and the UK um, time by an hour. So really try not to not to do that. Um, and so and also systems tend to crash the hour just before the submission deadline, just because that's when everyone submits. So try to submit it half a day earlier, at least, um, as a kind of standard rule, at least not the five minutes before, and because just uploading the last document might take too long. And then, as also was already answered by by, by Liz or Angelica in the end. Um, SVRI might come back and the panel might come back to you with some amendments. This also happens with some other grants. Um, they are normally in your favor, I would argue, or they, you know, um, they reflect some changes that would need to um, be made. It doesn't have, it would never change the top of the pr project completely. Um, but it is often based on discussions that, that were had, had in the panel then really get advice from others. And this really is now about your idea. So we heard a lot about eligibility and, and all these issues, but now the real core about this is your idea. And the most important thing is to share your idea clearly and concisely so that it's easy to understand for the people who review this grant. And it really helps to for, for that process to happen, to talk about your idea through with all different types of people, ideally your colleagues, other researchers, but also family members and friends. And I know that often you feel a bit, not ashamed, but a bit like very, because it's not yet developed, but actually talking about it helps you develop it, get different ideas and insights. And also not just your idea and the big question you have, but also how you want to approach it, what might be the right method, what right, might be the right approach within that method. And even try and show early drafts. Don't wait until the very end. Um, and you know, also once it is developed, show it to also senior people who have ideally um, um, experience in writing grants. And I also have to admit, I find it very painful to actually show some proposals to people, even when they're nearly ready, because I know these people and they might, I feel more judged by them than I feel judged by this anonymous panel. But really, this is, you know, they're normally are well-meaning. They, they really help you and you really want the people you know to provide comments before you submit it to the people who make the decision. But um, mock interviews, most horrible than their co your colleagues, I find. But even showing your proposal, every time I do this, I'm, I'm worried they come back to me and say like, Heidi, what a strange idea. So this is, um, it's very natural, but overcome it because it's you want to win this. And so it's important to receive this constructive criticism. 
your title, that's already a really important thing. This is the first thing reviewers will read and the panel will read. And ideally, the title shows very clearly what the study is about. And from reading the title, people already know what it is that you want to do. So it should be not too long. Often there are some criteria how long titles can be. Um, and it should already be, you know, exciting this kind of spark. Um, and so it has to be a bit of catchy, but at the same time, it has to be very unambiguous as well. And try not to use abbreviations like we all know VAC, VAX or WAR or IPV, but still try to write it out just to be on the safe side. Often we are too used to our acronyms by now, but other people might not be um, that used to it. And use, I would say, actually, because that question came up before as well, do use professional language and um, not be, be sloppy in your language. Also, again, because this is a project and not, for example, a paper, don't, you don't have to use necessary quotes in the title and really keep it to, to the content. And this is actually quite um, similar to, to the abstract that you're writing. So every proposal, and this is now from the SURI template for this grant, you will be asked to write a, write a background section. So what is required in a background section? And that really is you have to state out the current state of knowledge in, in the field, what is known and what is the problem. And by doing that on a broad way and, and narrowing down, you then should really go on to presenting what are the knowledge gaps? Because this is what you want to later say, I will address. You might have preliminary data already from M&E, from other small surveys. So this is also the place to bring that in and say, you know, worldwide or in our, my country or the country of study, this is known. We already know this, but this already helps you then to identify a gap. And ideally end this background section already with a short sentence saying what your study will be doing based on the knowledge gaps that you identified. You don't have to address all the knowledge gaps. You can then also only pick out one, um, but that is fine. And I just gave examples from one of my successful grant applications for the state of the field, where you should establish the significance of your topic, like violence against women is widespread. It has health outcomes that are detrimental for women. Um, you also might use this to define terminology. Obviously, this is a very specific grant, so most people know what IPV is, intimate partner violence, but it's still very good to state how you operationalize this topic, because it might come up later in the method, and then reviewers would look back into the background to do that. And you show that you're, it's also a way of showing that you're aware of the literature in, in your field. Don't oversight and overdo it, but I think it's it's a very good point to show that you are very knowledgeable and you also know the country you want to be working in. You have to present the knowledge gaps, as I just said, and this is also showing that you you are quite familiar with the topic. Um, you know what is out there and where your study might fit in. Um, so you explain what is missing about the topic in addition to what is known. But try to avoid, and, and sorry for the spelling mistake, extensive critique of previous studies. Obviously, in some ways, you do highlight that previous studies did X and Y, and they didn't do Z, and this is why you do Z. But don't go on for too long about, about that. Just as, um, you know, really focus on, on your work in some ways. And then quite importantly, what the study will be doing in a one or two, three sentences, which lays out your research question and lays out really the field for that and already says how your data and your study will, um, will fill, fill these gaps. For the SVRI grant now, it is um, the background section. Um, actually, this is a bit of a, of a replication, so I won't go through everything else again, but there also is a statement of need section, which again, where they mean is actually do state what are the gaps in knowledge um, and how you will address them and where you can really focus on what your study will achieve, what gaps it will address. Um, but try not to mention everything um, possible that you know about the topic. Really try to stay focused on laying the background for what you want to do. And one of the really important thing, and it's a separate section in the SVRI template, is the aims and objectives of your study. And this is the really core thing. We talked about, Gigi talked in the beginning about, you know, the innovation and what we really want, because with the SVRI grants, 
the field should be pushed forward. So this, this part is really important and they should be really focused. An aim, and an aim should not be too long actually. Um, so don't write an aim that goes over five, um, five, six, seven lines and includes all the objectives in there. It write your big research question or your aim um, as the big question that it is, and then state the objectives under it. So, so it, it becomes very clear what your overall aim is that you want to achieve. The objectives, um, they should be quite well defined because every objectives, all of them added together will help you to answer your big research question, your big aim. And they also will help you to quantify the success afterwards, after you've conducted the study, you will be able to say whether you met these objectives. Again, they should ideally be very concise and, and clear. Sometimes, and this is more depending on the study methods that you need to answer your question, you can also include hypothesis. Um, but ideally, don't just make them duplications then of the research questions and the objectives, because that's just a way of, of losing a lot of, of words. But just to illustrate this even better, when you have when you answered all the objectives, you have answered the aim of your study. Or if you answered all the objectives can be translated into research questions. If you answered all these questions in your study that you set as your objectives, you will have answered your study aim. So we always tend to look very carefully about what are the research questions, regardless of whether you frame them as questions, objectives, um, et cetera. But we, you know, the content of that must be there. The really important thing I would say is um, after the aims and objectives that we will look at are the method sections. And Enrica actually said really on nicely that honesty is really important. And I immediately thought that when sometimes you read um, method sections of research proposals and you feel like something is, is missing. And very often when I reviewed proposals of friends, I said like, you know, this is really unclear. Why didn't you state? And normally then the answer is because I wasn't that sure. So the thing is try not to hide some things that can't be decided. Sometimes things can't be decided at that stage, but just be very open about that and say, we still need to find this out. It's part of the process and only then can we determine the exact sample, for example. Um, and that is fine. It's just like if if the reviewers see that you're trying to hide something, it makes, makes one suspicious and you want to avoid that. But you can be open with things that are not known that will affect your design and that is okay. So it's the honesty that's, that's quite important and that normally doesn't work um, against, against you. And it has to be very, it has to be very clear basically what it is that you want to do and really focus on that section to be very clear about that because the grant is funding research. So methods are important. And there also needs to be some justification on why this method versus another, why this method is the right method for this question. So what does a method section need to have? It needs to speak about the study design the methods that are used, the setting, the population, the sample, what measurements are used, what analysis you are planning to use. Obviously, sometimes things can change, but you should have a kind of round plan in the beginning. And as was mentioned a couple of times by Chi Chi and others, ethics is really important in this grant, um, and it will be discussed with every proposal that is funded. So studies, a uh, study setting really has to talk about where is this going to take place? Who is the population? What is the population profile? What is the size of the sample? And again, qualitative, quantitative research has different sample sizes. This is completely fine. It just needs a good justification why this is the right sample size. Um, any other um, information you find important for um, the review panel to know or the reviewers? And then sometimes you, you might want to add a justification on why this setting versus another or why this population versus another. Um, and in general, if, if you feel that people might not be familiar with your setting, then do provide um, more information around it, especially if it's information that is really important to understand um, the research question or the method used. What is also important already at this stage to know is that you have thought about who will be included and who won't be included, for what reasons, into the sample, how you think the sampling strategy design might work, what time frame you thought about um, the whole project will be finished, but especially if it involves field work, what are the dates for it, um, the anticipated dates at least, and how you're planning to contact and recruit participants, because that is not always easy and has 
huge implications. Then I'll already give some information on the kind of um, tools that you will use um, and this study design in some ways, um, how, what kind of data you will rely on, if it's quantitative information on the variables you will use, what are your main outcomes, and why did you choose these outcomes versus other outcomes, the scale versus other out, um, scales. Um, it needs some detail, but not too much, obviously. And in some cases, also going into a bit around what analysis you are planning to do um, later on with, with, with the study, especially if you want to do some subgroup analysis and some stratification that might be useful. Ethical considerations, just because it's important, I will just um, reiterate it briefly again. It is not enough to state this has been reviewed or will be reviewed by X and Y review panel. We want to see, um, and SVRI wants to see, have you really thought about these ethical issues? Have you thought about the safety and well-being of your participants and actually also your staff members who are dealing with these very difficult issues? What have you taken? What steps have you taken or what, you know, standard operation procedures or other kind of issues and um, tools have you in place to make sure that this is really consistently adhered to? Um, and it might also include things about data protection from participants and, and other things. So really quite important for us. There isn't a special ethics section, I think, in it, but it has to be in the, in the methods or the theoretical framework at, at some point, and it will be really reviewed. Common mistakes often is that people put too much detail and then miss out on other things. It's always about the balance to provide all the necessary information in sufficient depth without um, missing out on some because they are word limitations. What is really quite irritating is when people copy and paste other studies, method sections um, into their own without adapting them appropriately. So that's really something one shouldn't do. I have seen it and it's, it's very irritating because you spend a lot of time trying to understand it. Um, but then also, and it kind of contradicts the too much detail is to have too little detail. So essential information just needs to be there. Key details about the method need to be there. And I hope that the previous slides help to show what are the key details um, in some extent. And then I called it impact, but it's actually, um, it's the actionability. The other word that is, is more used here is you have to show what, what impact will this work have? How will it be actionable? Um, and that relates to what the kind of outputs are. And I just put here the Medical Research Council in the UK's um, questions on impact that they have, because I, I thought they're really great summary of how do you reach people? How will you make sure that there's a sustainable impact on this? Um, even if it doesn't immediately address the needs of women, girls and children, how will it on the long term make a difference? And I think we all recognize that not everything immediately will have a, a, make a difference, but you, you should still show how, how this will happen. And I think this is what relates to the question on videos and, and games, et cetera. Um, in addition to peer reviewed outputs, what, what will you do to disseminate this, this findings? And in some ways really think about who will benefit from it, who are the end users of, of this work? The SVRI asked about a theoretical framework um, after the method section, and I think that's a very good, um, good point to make. Um, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time about what is a theoretical framework or what is a conceptual framework as well, because in the violence against women field, we often and children, actually in addition, sorry, and we draw on a lot of different theories and we draw on a lot of different ideas about pathways and we try to bring them together. So um, just to put it in other words, conceptual frameworks and theoretical frameworks are things that allow you to move beyond descriptive, so just explaining what you see into explaining how and why things are connected. Why does an intervention work? So that's more the theory of change. Um, but also why is alcohol use, for example, associated with violence? And how can we then you know, interrupt um, this association? And it helps you to give you an explanation set basically of what you see and how your questions and your data and everything kind of flows together. It might also help you when you're developing a survey tool or an interview guide to filter out questions that shouldn't be in that guide so that you can really focus on the core questions that should be in there. 
and it can really help you as a reference point um, in the methodology section and, and the results section later when you, you think about it. So just give you some ideas about how frameworks might look like. You always have an outcome, which often case here would be violence against women and girls or violence against children. And if you're looking at, for example, health risks associated with trafficking, you can already um, build up the main health risk that might be associated with your outcome. And then you might wanna find proof about it, but you already have a certain idea in your head. So this helps you to kind of list them and, and put them up. Um, graphically. Again, this is very descriptive, just that this is linked to the other. One of our lovely questions, we have an ecological framework, which is a conceptual framework in the violence against women and violence against children field, where we put all the different risk factors on an individual macro, micro community relationship level. This is also a conceptual framework, but it helps you to think about all the risk factors you might want to be interested in. We also have causal frameworks that really tell us why do we think, for example, does alcohol use lead to more intimate partner violence? And what are actually the factors that might mediate that causal relationship? We might have relational frameworks. So we, we, we for example, with mental health, is violence linked to mental health? So is mental health um, leading to violence? So that's another um, way how we can um, put it. Or why is, we know that there's violence against children and violence against women in the same household. Um, so what, what is kind of explaining um, this link between the two of them without really saying what is, comes earlier and what comes later? How you build a conceptual framework, and I know this is very brief now, but basically when you know your research question, it's really helpful to just use a blank sheet of paper and write down your main outcome. And then think of everything that might come there without really looking into the literature, it's just based on your beliefs, your ideas, um, just on the top of your head, based on your knowledge. And then in the second row, actually find evidence for that in the literature, and that will help you to refine your framework. Sometimes you have existing frameworks that you can build on, and then you can use them for your study, critique them, expand them, but sometimes you have to build your own, and then this approach might be um, an easy forward step. Just coming to some writing skills, because very often reviewers, depending on, on different grant calls, they review and score 10 to 30 applications. So that's quite a lot um, of applications you have to read through. So a new main task is to make life as easy as possible for them. So again, try to be really clear and precise. For people who English is not the first language, it's actually really great that the shorter your sentences, the better. You don't have to write complicated long sentences. They are hard to read. It's actually better to be really clear, short. Um, and you can write short sentences. They're normally much easier to, to, to grasp. Um, try to play around a little bit with the formatting. I know there's very little space, but you know, do write paragraphs to make, you know make spaces in between wherever possible. And as I said before, try to make as little grammar mistakes as, as possible because grammar mistakes often um, might change some of the meaning and might make less clarity. Liz, I think already mentioned Angelica about the partners. And I think that's quite important. Often, at least in the beginning, when I started writing grant proposals, I felt that I, I do need people with big names on, on my grants. And in some cases, and with some funders, this is true, but not with this grant. Um, so you don't necessarily need to have um, a big name on your budget. I think you can put them into advisory board if you feel that they're a real benefit. But the real question is, how is, the, how is the partnership looking like? Is this an equal partnership? And for, for you as the lead organization for the grant, is, do you trust them? Because in the end, you will have to work with them. So do you really enjoy working with them? Do you feel that this is a very good relationship? Um, and do they really fit your proposal? Do they have the skills you need? And I think that's a quite, that's the most important question. And that, will, that kind of then shows that it's a really good partnership. And the other question, of course, is also um, whether they're capable of delivering, because one thing that the SVRI grant will look at is, um, is the proposal realistic? Is the relationship realistic? Is the partnership realistic? 
So this is my last slide, really just the top tips. And I hope I didn't put you off with all these things that are expected when writing a grant proposal. But the most important thing is that as we arrive, no one can review a proposal we never got. So please do, if you have a great idea, give SVRI a chance to review it and to kind of, you know, change your idea with it. I know some people asked whether they could get feedback and it wasn't possible. But the thing is that after a year, when you look at your proposal now, you will see, you will think slightly different and it will improve every time, even just by your own, um, and, you know, your own look at it with some distance. Um, what I really said, there needs, and the other thing is, there needs to be consistency between your aims, what you aim to do, what your methods are, and what your budget in the end also is, because they really need to be consistent. Um, budget was mentioned already. It, it is always looked at, especially the explanation of how it is, is spent, how, how fair it is distributed, whether it's distributed according to um, the methods. Um, the other thing also I think is important, try not to pack too much into it because you think that you are more likely to get it if you promise a zillion thousand things. If you have a very good idea and you have a very good strategy of how you might want to go about this and what you will deliver, that is fine. You don't need to do an additional qualitative study on the side and an additional video. Sorry, just to point that, I'll use that example. It's okay to really focus on your strong idea because that might get a bit diluted if you're promising too many things. But really just show us that your ideas are worthy and they're exciting. Um, and the other thing is also you have to be more self-promotional than it might feel comfortable um, because you wanna sell your idea and, and your grant. So, and that is also okay to, you know, state a little bit more than you normally would do in your normal life. So be confident and, um, and really convince those that your ideas are, are worth it. Yeah. So I'm sharing the same things that Angelica did and thank you really a lot um, for bearing with me and listening to me. Heidi, thank you so much. That was an incredible overview and session. Very quick, so we probably need to do it again and again and again. But thank you very much and really thoughtful. And I loved all the top tips and the ideas of keeping our proposals short, concise, clear, building on the evidence, working in partnerships, how it's going to make a difference, all the things we love and um, care deeply about.